The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to our Friday webinar. We're really excited about this one today. This is actually a presentation that uh, Randy Wallen and I gave to the National uh, American Concrete Pipe Association group about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, we did this one and got some great response. This is an, an overview and kind of a basic high-level look at box culverts. And... Uh, we're going to be talking about specifying precast box culverts, uh, the design, what you should be looking for, uh, when, what you should put on the plans, what you need to inspect, um, how to coordinate these during construction. So this is a very high level thing. Randy and I will be doing this together today. So we're really excited uh, to share that with, with both of you or with all of you, both of us together. Um, we also have with us, in, in addition to Randy, we've got uh, Randy with Old Castle Precast or Old Castle Infrastructure. We've got Mike Blackham with Geneva Pipe and Precast. So, uh, welcome, Mike. How are you doing today? Doing good, thank you, Jason. Good to hear. Good to hear, Randy. We, uh, how are you feeling? You ready to ready to jump into this presentation? Um, I'm kind of honoring and jaded today, so oh. just typical. I was gonna say, so nothing, nothing new. Then it's just the the same old. So, Perfect. And and I'm I'm going to apologize in advance. I I didn't have time to put in my uh, my pajama pictures today, so I'm going to be posting that to to a Facebook right after this. I um I, I got busy and got into a hurry, and I didn't get a chance to get that get that put in there. But um I, I'm I'm I've got a sad face in my picture where where I'm wearing my pajamas. You'll see it on our our Mountain States Facebook page. Uh, but I think they're going to cancel my baseball season this year. So I'm wearing my Lakers baseball and my anchor jammy pants. So uh, hopefully everybody gets a chance to see how sad I am that I may not be able to have my, my kids play baseball at all this year. But anyways, with uh, that, um, Randy's got the, not, uh, Oh, go ahead, Randy. That's not the picture that I have in here for you. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, that's I thought funny. I should really put, my own picture in and what Jason, what I would picture Jason and his jammies. We had that contest last week about what people thought we, um, and I decided, I decided not to Photoshop you in some jammies, Jason, because it was probably going to be inappropriate and disgusting. And well, so we, we want to keep these things PG. I, I guess it's Friday. We could go as far as PG 13 if we need to. So, and, and so the winner from last week, he suggested a movie called Zardoz, which is Z-A-R-D-O-Z. -Z, and it starred Sean Connery and it was pretty obscure. And there was a question whether those were jammies, but I could see that people are probably Googling that now. And, and I decided probably not to Photoshop Jason's face on that, but it was probably wise. So um as always we will be uh, tracking attentiveness on this presentation we're able to to watch who's who's uh, paying attention and who's not so uh we'll be sending out a gift card to those that are that are the most attentive so uh, make sure you're answering the poll questions that we have make sure that you're you're uh you're you're watching and you're paying attention also if you do have any questions there is an opportunity for you to to uh, type in some questions we we typically like to go through those at the very end. So if you ask a question, please stick around to the end. We're going to try to wrap this up about five minutes to the hour, and then we'll take uh, that that last five minutes to to handle some questions. So if you do have questions, feel free to shoot those in. Again, this is going to be very high level, but if if we if we get a lot of questions and we want more detail, we can maybe look at doing one in coming weeks that gets a little bit more detailed into the design aspects of this. So um, we don't want to get too caught up in the weeds today, but that's where we're going to be where we're going to be heading and going? Uh, probably the last administrative issue. Um, PDHs are available, and I know that uh, this may burst Jason's bubble, but I've had some people tell me that's the only reason they're attending. And so um, make sure Jason will get those out. I think it made him feel bad yesterday that somebody said they were really good PDHs, but I don't know if he said he loved Jason. So, okay. <laughs> Any free PDH is a good PDH, right? Okay, let's jump in here. Uh, this is something, this is a, a photo out in Taylorsville of some nice box culvert with some elbows in it. Um, so we're going to talk about how to specify, um, get it approved for design and coordinate the construction aspect of it. So um, here's my photo. So if, uh, I tried to keep it professional and, and, and the hard hat probably hides my gray hair. So I think that's a good way to handle that. Um, and what 
what we're doing here is we're doing a plant tour. Um, so make sure we hope to be able to do these in, uh, later this year again. And, and uh, I'm with Old Castle Infrastructure, as Jason said, and I've got 32 years of experience. And so um, I'm just happy to be here today. Um, down here, this is Jason. Jason's our co-presenter. This is the photo I've got in there, Jason. Are, do you want to say anything about yourself before I uh, keep going? I, you know, I think people at this point probably have heard enough about me and know about me enough. So I just, I'm just happy to be here. Love, love my job. Love, love the work that I'm able to do with Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. I love being able to provide these these training opportunities for for all of you. As always, just a, another administrative thing. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, that I have uploaded all of the previous webinars to, and this one will also be uploaded to that. So if you need to go back and refer to something, uh, it's just go to YouTube and look for Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association, and all of these uh, webinars are uploaded to that to that YouTube page. So you can go back and and watch them. Uh, do it with your spouse. I'm sure your uh, your non-engineer spouse would love to watch some of these presentations with you on a Friday Saturday night. You know, it's a great date night. So consider that. It it's kind of distracting. People are texting me about uh, Zardoz jammies and stuff <laughs> for you, Jason. So, so okay, let's get going. Is, are they jammies or not? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that question at the end. So okay. um, we're going to talk about um, that these ought to be designed to the correct standards. And in the case where we're talking about this as Mountain State, you need, we both have structural engineers on staff. Mike's on, on the call today from Geneva, and we have our structural engineer. So we're gonna talk a lot about how we stamp these. So that's gonna be one of the takeaways. Um, you should, how you should specify these. We'll go, go through that. And then the installation is a critical process of this. So we'll talk about all these things and we'll wind this up at the end. Um, best practice is to have the local manufacturer design because he knows what he has as far as forms. And in fact, sometimes this is something I may have to check on, but it would differ from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, we're both going to design these to a, a standard, typically in an ASTM standard, but we might have slightly different things that we can do within that ASTM standard. Um, how we order our steel, it might even vary a little bit from which company we order our steel from. And, and what their capabilities are. We're gonna design the steel to meet the needs of the loading of the box culvert, but we're gonna we're gonna do the steel detailing in a way that makes the most sense for our plant. So it doesn't make sense for the consultant on the project to do a lot of work on the design of the of the steel if it's gonna be precast because it's gonna very much change once we do our submittals. Um, we're gonna we have our mixed designs that are already set up. Uh, we typically are over-designed as far as what our mixed design comes out to. Um, we're gonna meet the, the standards that are called out in the specs, but we usually have higher early strengths. So um, you wouldn't know exactly what our mixed designs were or different things if you were trying to design to that. Um, we're gonna meet the design codes. Typically we're designing to ASHTO and ASTM, but there's other things that come up that we're designing to sometimes, and we'll take those into account. Our engineers will take those into account. Um, we want to encourage people to use a precast plant that's got an approved QA, QC program. And what that means is um, we're typically certified through a third party, either NPCA or ACPA. I know this came up last week. Jason had somebody that had no experience making manholes that was all of a sudden making manholes and they weren't they didn't have any kind of qc and that's something that's in apwa specifications uh, i believe it's in udot specifications so keep that in mind uh, it's really important that we're doing the compressive breaks that we're doing the testing we need to do um I'm going to refer to this project a little bit. This was out in West Valley City. This was a 16 by 6 box culvert that went in about 10 years ago. The, the reason I brought this up is uh, West Valley recently called us and we were able to take the wing wall and apron that was on the one side, it was actually the opposite side of this, but we were actually able to pull it off 
um, and reuse it and extend the box culvert by three pieces on one side. And it still fit together, the joint worked great, everything, it was a real success that way. So I'm showing some pictures from this. Um, here were the some of the original plans for this. Now I hopefully I've blocked out where the engineer stamp is, so I don't have anybody's numbers on there. Or but this shows down on the more on the right hand side, they called out what the precast size should be. So they called out a 16 by 6, and on this it looks like it had 10 inch walls. Uh, it and different top and bottom slab. I think what we actually built was just, um, we may have had just slightly different thicknesses on that, but that was one of the things they called out and we would do the, the design of that. This shows their layout of this crossing 7200 West. Um, you can see that they didn't put a lot of detail into this layout. Um, you don't want to in precast call out what the lay length should be or other things. It, it's good to call us if you have questions and get an idea where, where this would end up lining up. And you can see here that they've got a phase line and a construction joint. This was for the cast in place option or if they were going to um, do half the highway at a time. In this case, they ended up shutting it down for a weekend and installing the whole box culvert in a weekend. So they didn't have to have like a phase line, but it's really good to coordinate with us if you're looking at phase lines or phase construction with one lane in each direction or something like that where you're trying to maintain traffic and do the box culvert in phases. Hey, uh, you can see also. So was, did you say this one was originally designed to be cast in place and then they decided to, to switch it to precast or? It was designed as precast as an alternate bid. Okay. It, it, interesting, that's a good question. It ended up being, the precast was about $6,000 more was my recollection, but that doesn't even include the time it takes for people to go out and do inspection, the uh, traffic control. Can you imagine cast in place having this road down or traffic control out for a month at a time? Yeah. So the city opted to spend a little bit more conceptually in that bid and and go to precast just because they could finish it so much more quickly and they could also not have all the other associated costs and all the headaches and complaints. Too. Oh yeah, the headaches alone of all the phone calls of complaints and that. That's it. That brings up a good uh, a good time to do a poll question here. We're gonna have a poll question for you guys. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and launch this right now. Feel free to answer. Have you ever specified a precast box culvert for the manufacturer to design? So not you as the engineer, but the actual manufacturer, have them design it. Got about 30% of you voted. Feel free to, to vote on this. Okay. Half of you have voted. We'll take just a couple more seconds here. We're up to 60% of you have voted. All right. Looks like that's probably about everyone's going to gonna vote there. So I'm going to close that and I'll tell you the, uh, oh, I'll share the uh, the results there. Here we go, the poll results, yes, 38% said yes. They have uh, they have designed it and 63% said no. And if you add those up, that's 101%, I just realized. So way to go, we're overachieving already. So it sounds like most are, uh, when they're specifying uh, box culverts, they're, they're maybe doing the design in-house, Randy. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Okay. So well, I'll thanks, Jason. You. you bet. So um, this is an aerial photo where this went in in 7200 West. This is when it was only um, like a one lane in each direction street going north south. You can see the canal that was like a Kennecott Canal going through there. Um, you can see what that looked like after construction. And um, just to point out that they now have extended, they were going to 
put a, a signal going through here and connect these roads differently. So they needed to extend this. And I think the Salt Lake County is looking to extend the other side also. So with development on there, it really worked out well that the box culvert could be um, rebuilt and connect to the same joint. Um, as we talked about, we want to meet national design standards. Uh, it's great to have the strength verified so that, that you know that these QC standards provide you with compressive brakes and other things to tell you that you're getting what you need out there and we can provide that all. Um, the installation, we've worked a lot with contractors. We'll talk about it later in the presentation, but we've set up installation that makes this e easy to go in and really works out well. The speed, just to give you an idea, this one, uh, it was probably a, um, about 120 feet went in an, in a day on a, I was out there on a Saturday. And, and so uh, there's a lot of activity going on and everything else when one of those goes in, but then you can start backfilling that immediately. And there's a lot of design versatility. Uh, as, as you see later, we've done a lot of different applications and, and variations on these things. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is we will do the layout. Now, this is a different project, a longer project, but this shows that we have laid out all this to match lines. And typically, we're putting a half inch gap in the joint detail down here. Um, we want to recognize that the contractor doesn't pull these exactly together. There's some variation in that. We found by experience that a half inch is a pretty good thing for a layout. Now, if you've got structures anywhere along this or elbows or something else, you may have to control that joint creep so you don't get the box culvert lengthening over a lot of pieces or shrinking a little bit. Um, and if we're making certain elbows, you've got to make sure that that elbow comes in exactly the right place so that the angle that it was made to still works in the field. So there's a lot of things. If you ever have questions about these kind of things, call me or Mike. Um, Old Castle or Geneva and we'll help you with these things. And Jason can help you with these things too. Also, when we do submittals, we're submitting with our stamp on there um, how we're making these. And typically, um, I will talk about the steel later, but we're, we're laying out all these steel details and we go through and we're designing them to ASTM nomenclature which calls out this AS1, AS2, AS3. It's over to the side here, and it's a little bit confusing, but basically, Jason's going to talk about it a lot, but basically two cages, an in, inner and outer cage, and then steel areas of how many square inches per the, of steel we're putting in there, what the rebar is, or the welded reinforcing per inch in there. So, Jason, um, I'll try and control for you and not miss a beat, but why don't you take over? Perfect, let's do that. Let's go, uh, when we look at the box culvert uh, terminology, a couple of things that you need, to, you need to know is, first of all, the span is always listed first. So every, every now, most of the time we can tell when a contractor says, you know, let's say, I, or, a, or a, excuse me, an engineer says, we need a, a 12 by six box. Uh, generally, we're going to say, okay, a 12 by 6, or even if they say a 6 by 12, we know that typically your span's going to be longer than your height. But we always like to to just check in case it's, um, you know, in case there's an issue there. But span should always be listed first. So on this, where you see a 12 by 6, that's 12 foot span, 6 foot of rise, or 6 foot height. And these dimensions are always internal. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're looking at the internal dimensions of these. So that's just kind of the terminology and nomenclature uh, that you use there. Um, one one thing that I, before I jump into specs real quick, um, I just want to want to go back to something that Randy said, where he said, you know, if you have any questions, call him or call Mike or, or call, call myself, call Jason. I, I'm happy to help you with any of these technical questions. I did get an email this morning from an engineer asking about pricing. And, and uh, I will be forwarding that on to Randy and Mike and Heather over at Geneva. Um, I don't really know what the pricing is because I represent multiple companies and they have, you know, their competitors. So I'm not allowed to know what the prices are. So if you have any price questions, uh, probably go directly to the, the, the member companies of Geneva Pipe and Precast or Old Castle Infrastructure. They would, they would be able to give you pricing information a little bit better. So keep that in mind. If you want to know for your engineer's estimate what a box culvert costs, 
uh, reach out to the manufacturers directly. And uh, I've got that information available on my website, mountainstates.concretepipe.org, where you can get a hold of the, the different member companies. But let's jump into specifications. I know this is um, arguably the most exciting part of, of our, our uh, engineering that we do. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to keep it kind of tempered down and mellow this out a little bit because I don't want us to get too excited about these specifications. But I am going to talk about a lot of different specifications and specs that are uh, that are national specs, and then I'll give a quick poll here right after I go through these to see which ones you are familiar with. So, uh, ASTM C789, uh, this was the box culvert spec, and it's actually very similar to the Ashto M259 spec. This is this was a box culvert specification that was uh, from any fill depths, and, and it had tables, and it was kind of a grab and go spec where you would pull from a table, and this was from two feet of cover up to 25 feet of cover. And then ASTM had a second spec, uh, a, a, a sister spec, we'll say, that is ASTM C850, same idea, tables, and you would pull that off, it gave you all the steel areas and things, we'll go over what that looks like in a moment. But that was for anything less than two feet. So Ashto M273 is the same spec there. So you've got the ASTM specs and the Ashto specs, and they're they're very very similar now after a few years astm said you know what let's combine both of these instead of having two separate specs of 789 and 850 let's combine those two and have one spec and that'll be 1433 so astmc 1433 is the box culvert specification that combines those two so now it goes from zero feet of cover to 25 feet of cover in these tables. I should point out that Ashto has not has not combined those, so they still have two separate specs, 259 and 273. Uh, once Ashto updated the LRFD loading requirements and the calculations in the HL93 load, that's when ASTM said we need to update 1433 to take into account the LRFD live loads and the the way that we calculate these things and all the design considerations there, and so they. They updated 1433 to include LRFD, so that's the 1577. This is the one that we use most commonly because most DOTs and most uh, municipalities are referencing that LRFD HL93 live load. Those are for design and when we're when we're looking at what sizes to use. When we get to installation, the C1675 spec, and Randy's going to talk a little bit later about, about some best practices on installation, and we're pulling a lot of those from this ASTM C1675 box culvert installation spec. Uh, Ashto LRFD sections 3, 4, 5, 12, and 14 uh, are, are what we what we do on, on Ashto there. Um, and then ASCE 2697 is uh, is the, the one that we we got to look at here when we're looking at uh, which design which designs to go with. Uh, this was that's that has and I'm gonna get into all of these a little bit more in detail, but uh, we'll we'll go ahead and, and uh, take a look and move on to the next one here. Um, this is this is C1577. This is the the design spec for for box culverts. Um, so this is with the one that, as I mentioned, this is the one that's updated with Ashto LRFD. This is what it looks like. This one uh, provides, and like I said, I, I call it a grab and go spec because what it is is we have all of these tables uh, that you'll go into and you'll pull them out and, and we'll we'll look at what one of those tables looks like. There's a couple of other design things to consider. Like for instance, it recommends using 5,000 psi compressive strength uh, per ASTM C 1577. In addition. Uh, it, you need to meet all the concrete performance requirements per ASTM C 1577. So this talks about your tolerances, how to manufacture it, how to repair it, and all of that. Uh, this is now a, a table that is what I was talking about. So if you're a design engineer and, or, or if you're a manufacturer and you look on the plans and they're calling out a 12 by 8, this is one where we can, and, and say, you know, 10 feet of cover, 12 by 8 with 10 feet of cover, we can go in and grab this. It has already designed, already laid out for you what your steel areas are and how you're going to look at that. So these, if you notice here along the top, you've got your, or your on the left-hand side, you've got your design earth cover in feet. It has broken down. You've got your 12 by 9 or 12 by 8 by 12, 12 by 9 by 12, 12 by 10 by 12. Um, Randy, I'll put you on the spot here that, that we know that span is first. So we've got 12 foot span. On that top one, eight foot rise. What's that? What's that third term? That twelve inches. 
Um, in that case, that should be the wall thickness. That is the wall thickness. So that is your thickness all the way around your box. So that would be a 12 inch floor, a 12 inch top slab, 12 inch sidewall. So yes, that is your wall thickness. So directly under there, it talks about the circumferential reinforcement areas. These areas of steel are square inches per foot. Okay, so when you look at um, AS1, AS2, all the way across there up to AS8, Randy was mentioning in that table, they've got the AS1 through AS8 um, in their design when they're doing that. Uh, this is where they're coming from, and this is where those those numbers come from. So when you look at like um, your AS1, your 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 steel area of 10 feet deep on your 12 by 8 box, it's 0.34 square inches per foot. Um, if we go on to the next slide here, we're going to go through, and I'll show you where all of these steel areas correspond and where they're at there. So AS1 is the first one here, and that is going to be your outer cage all the way around that. Um, so if you look there, uh, Randy's cursor there with AS1, that's your outer steel there. AS2 is going to be that, that circumferential or hoop steel that goes around the box, um, and it's, it's going to be in the bottom, it, excuse me, the, the inside cage of your top slab, okay? AS3 is down on the bottom slab, also that inside cage, right? Um, and then your AS4 will be your inside cage on your sidewalls. Okay, now, you notice on that, on that picture we showed you, the table we showed you before, on the zero to two feet of cover, there's AS5, AS7, and AS8. However, on this one, uh, or on, on those that are higher than two feet of, of cover, they only have AS1, AS2, AS3, and AS4. So when you have these really heavy loads, and, and very little cover, that's where we need to put in what we call distribution steel. So AS5 is going to be your distribution reinforcement in the top slab on that inside cage. And what that is, is that's the steel that goes along the, it's perpendicular to your, to your, uh, your hoop steel or the steel that runs from left to right. So AS2 runs left to right across the box, okay? And your distribution, in AS5 is going to run along the flow line of your box, okay? So that's what your AS5 is. Your AS7 is the same thing. It's your distribution reinforcement that runs um, along that, and it's that outside, that, that top slab outside reinforcement. So that's what that's, that's uh, referring to. So your, your outside reinforcement is going to be different when we have very little cover. And then your AS8 is your bottom slab outside reinforcement. So if you're, if you don't, if you have more cover than two feet, you can use that AS1 steel area all the way around the outside. If you've got less two feet of cover or less, then you would have different reinforcement on AS7 and AS8, which are your top and bottom reinforcement, um, because you've got to have a little bit more, more steel in there than just your, your uh, outside steel on those, on those deep covers there. So so keep that in mind. That's that's uh, something to to consider there. Um, as we move forward and we look, this is um, our steel reinforcement. There are two different types of reinforcement on these boxes. Uh, we have tied rebar is one, and the other is welded wire. Okay. So keep in mind that these actually have different yield strengths. So the table that we have there, these are based on rebar yield strengths. Rebar has a yield strength of 60 KSI, but welded wire actually has a higher yield strength. And uh, it, it's up to 70, I wanna say 70, 75 KSI. Maybe Mike, Mike and Randy, you guys can help me out there. I wanna say 75 KSI on the welded wire. So it's a higher yield strength. So those values in the table. They, they actually allow us to go to 70. Okay. Uh, we'll get certifications in that it's higher than that, probably around 75. But So when anyway. we're designing, we're designing to 70, even though sometimes it still is a little bit higher. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, that is... And I believe, I double-checked, Jason, but I believe they have the AS actually call out for 65 in those tables. If I remember. Okay, so it's so the tables are a little bit higher. Exact, but gotcha. Yeah, it's a little lower so that they, the... Your, you know your cover. Okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Mike. You're kind of cutting out there a little bit, but uh, but thank you for uh for that information there. So so keep that in mind that 
And, and that's a good question. That brings up a good question for our manufacturers, um, Randy and Mike. Do you, what what percentage of boxes are you doing with with rebar versus welded wire? Um, do you know right off the top of your head what if you're using one more than the other in this in these markets? As, uh, as I would say, in in Utah, I've seen Geneva use roughly. I'd say 95% are the mesh welded wire fabric compared to maybe only 5% uh, rebar. Now up in Idaho where I'm at, I, I would say it's more of a 50-50. Um, we could go into some of the reasons why if you want, but that's what I've seen. Okay. okay. Um, I'd say we're consistent as far as real high percentage with welded wire reinforcement and with labor and other things difficult to find. Um, laborers then it really helps us to be able to order this in in sheets and then and then fold it to the box size we need but it's custom ordered right okay okay good to know good to know um yeah the the sheets they come in just flat and then they the the manufacturer will fold them into the into the the shape that it needs to be to fit into the box uh, the the box cover there so that's 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 a uh, really interesting there. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and throw out a poll question here. Interestingly enough, we had uh, some comments there that the poll question wasn't working, which makes sense why we only had about 70% of people vote. Some people said that their their poll wasn't working. So I'm going to try to uh, to share another poll here. I apologize if you guys aren't able to to vote. You should just be able to click on whichever one as soon as I make it uh, live here. So I'm going to ask this question here. Oops. I'm going to launch it right there. Which National specification does your local spec reference? Uh, ASTM C 1577, ASTM C 1433, Ashto M 273, or M 279. None of the above, or I have no idea. I am not sure. Go ahead and and uh, and check that and see. Okay, looks like we've got. About 60% of you voted here. Looks like, looks like, yeah, some of you are getting blocked out there for whatever reason, because it seems like some of them, they're, they're not able to vote on those. So I apologize to those of you that are not able to vote. Um, sorry about that, guys. We'll try to figure out uh, what's going on there while, we, while we're presenting here and, and figure that out. But um, about 80%, let me, let me close this and share it. It looks like, um, 1577, about 10%, Ashto, 10%, uh, not sure about 79, 80% of you, uh, not sure. So I'll, I'll just give you a quick little rundown here. Those who are using, um, those who are using the a APWA specs, uh, it references C1577. Uh, it also, uh, references... Um, I, I actually don't know. I'm just pulling it up here, and it looks like they do not reference the Ashto ones, just the C1577. So they've got the most up-to-date one there in APWA. I know UDOT references uh, C1577 and the Ashto 273 and 279s. Um, but if you've got local ones, we've written some local, you know, just, uh, just specs that we've given out to people that they can use in our local markets, and those are uh, those ones reference the C1577 as well. So thank you very much. That was good. Uh, I appreciate that. So, um, okay. Well, we if we look at this, when we look at the box culvert sizes that are available in ASTM C 1577, as I mentioned, that's a grab and go. Um, these are sized between from three foot by two foot. So that's our three foot span by two foot rise up to a 12 by 12. Uh, make sure you don't get that 12 by 12 mixed up. That's 12 foot span by 12 foot rise. You don't want to get those backwards. Um, that was a joke. Sorry, I gotta entertain myself somehow. If you know what what happens if if you have a fill more than say 25 feet, these tables went up to 25 feet. Or what happens if you need a 15 by 10 or a or a, or a 14 by 10? Now, some of the questions we get are, um, can we do these on a, on a half foot increment? You know, the tables are all one foot increments. And so, Randy, let's say someone comes to you and says, hey, I don't need a, you know, because of some utility conflicts, um, instead of a seven by five, we need this to be a six and a half by five. Uh, what, what are, what are, what's a design engineer's 
you know, options there. And I can't hear Randy. I I wonder if we lost Randy. Oh, I'm here. Sorry. Oh, I have to unmute. Oh. So, so uh, most of the time we would just go design that um, for you. But there's times when you can interpolate within the tables. It really depends on what what that exact question became. Yeah. But most of the time we're going to go and design it and stamp it. There's times when people might just over design it a little bit for the next step down. There's a lot of ways to handle it. Okay, so maybe if they they may just put in the still for the seven by five, um, if that's easier, or or just design it. Okay, and that's I just want to make sure these design engineers know what what some of their options are and what they can do. So thank you for sharing that, Randy. Um, you know, if if we get into those bigger situations, as Randy mentioned, they would design it on a on an on on an interesting you know a different size. But if we get into those larger sizes or 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 large depths or even different loads, maybe we need something different. Then in HL93, that's when we would be looking at, at different options there. So, so when we look at these special or modified designs, those are going to be for sizes that are outside of the tables. Uh, maybe there's a modified thickness. Maybe we need, you know, sometimes we can look at um, a design that could save a little bit of money because maybe because the loading's different, we don't want to use those. Maybe we can thin up the walls a bit to save, save you a little bit of money. And, and so we can do that to modify the thickness, maybe 12 inch thick walls is is a uh, overkill and we don't need that we could save you a little bit of money maybe we can change the steel based on loading now maybe there's heavier loads you know maybe you're dealing with say airport loading um a uh, railroad arima has different load load restrictions and things uh deep fills 30 plus feet you know to, or more than 25 feet so these are things that we can look at in our manufacturing plants and, and say, you know what, we can do, we can do a different design and we can, we can make it custom to whatever you need and whatever you're putting on the plans. So when we, when we look at the design requirements for precast, these are just a few things to keep in mind here on what some of our design requirements are. All right. First of all, we've got to design these as a rigid frame. Okay. So, so if let's say you're putting together a spec and you're going to put this out and, and this, these are some things that we, we would recommend that you include in your spec. If you go to our website, mountainstates.concretepipe.org, we have a sample spec that you can pull off and use. And it's, it's written, it's based off of the, the same format of, uh, of the APWA spec. So if you want to use this as a supplemental spec on a, on a, on a project, uh, these are basically what the recommendations are for the manufacturer in their design. We have, you know, our two manufacturers in our in our association, Old Castle and Geneva. Uh, but there are some other manufacturers that that make these, and they will hire out a consultant engineer to do the design. This is basically giving some some requirements on what we what they should be putting in their design to make sure it's designed correctly and it's gonna it's gonna serve the life correctly. Um, the other one would be load combinations need to be designed in compliance with ASCE 2697 section 11. All right, that's really important that they that they do those uh, those load combinations and and that they're they're evaluating all of those. The other one is uh, the design load criteria needs to be designed this the same as C 1577. Uh, we need to look at crack control. Crack control uh, equations are very important based on where we're placing our steel and what our D distances are. Um, and then also we need to look at preparing special designs according to uh, AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications, which is section 12. Okay, I'm gonna go through each of these uh, briefly and why these are so important, all right? So first let's talk about, about why we need two cages of steel. This is a sample moment diagram. Uh, that, that, that I include here just to show that in these boxes, uh, when, when we're dealing with rectangular or square structures, the issue is that we're getting these positive and negative moments. And these positive and negative moments are bending around the corners and around the edges. And so if we're only putting one cage of steel in this box, and let's say we put it right in the middle, the unfortunate thing is, a lot of times you're missing these these high moment zones of these positive and negative moments. And as it bends around the corner and you get these big moments around the corner, if we only have steel in the middle of the box, so if it's a 12 inch thick box and we put steel right in the middle of it, we're not gonna be capturing those moments at the corners, which can cause excessive cracking and, and, and open these things up to, 
to to failures and and limiting the the design life of these things. So we 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 have to be making sure that we've got these two cages of steel uh, so that we're catching those positive and negative moments as it bends around. All right. Keep in mind on this specification, this this sheet here on uh, directly from C1577. Notice that it shows in both of these diagrams two cages of steel tying in around those corners. So it's very important that we follow this this guideline and this recommendation to have the two cages of steel. Um, additionally, in 1577, uh, these are the load requirements. Um, this is this is right out of that that page there, uh, uh, right out of the notes in table one recommending what to design. It's uh, it, This should be designed on note three there. I want to draw attention to that. This is for an HL93 live load without the lane load. All right, so keep that in mind that it's without the without the lane load and it should be designed with for the design truck and check against the design tandem as well. All right, so uh, this next slide here uh, would be the uh, the crack control situations here. This is from Ashto LRFD. This is section 5.7.3.4, as you notice there. And this talks about crack control. On the next slide, it should have the uh, the equations that are that are in there for Ashto LRFD. So these are these are the equations that we need to be checking against. Now, what's interesting is we found some really interesting things where these crack control equations in Ashto are are really designed for larger structures um, where we're going to be having two cages. And this is another reason why we need to have two cages. We were doing some designs and checking some designs on catch basins that were smaller walls, six inch thick walls, and we were able to put um, one cage of steel in on some of these smaller depths. What was interesting was that we noticed that when you start throwing this D distance off, right, which is the cover, uh, basically the distance from your uh, from where the load's being placed to where your steel is, um, we were getting some really interesting readings when we were using these crack control equations. So we found for smaller underground structures, uh, these these didn't work as well for, for a single cage of steel. Uh, it really is designed for thicker walls with two cages of steel. We were using the ACI equations that we've got better readings and actually um, more more conservative uh, values for our for those smaller underground catch basin structures and uh, just something to keep in mind though so these are really good for for box culverts but for smaller structures maybe not so much all right this is is uh section 12 of ashto lrfd this is it, the the title of it is buried structures and tunnel liners these are the special designs that we need to be following when we're looking at it the, this has all the equations and everything in it now i'm going to give a plug here next about um a software that we use called ET Culvert. All right, and the ET Culvert software is uh, created by Ericsson Technologies or Ericsson Software. That's what the ET stands for is Ericsson Technologies. And this is a software that is a, a rigid frame design software and it's a, a rating software. So when we design these, it's taking into account all of these things. I don't know if it's that next slide there, Randy, if we've got the ET Culvert information there. Um, I guess not. I guess I, I added it in on a, on a different version here. Uh, but, but basically, ACPA, the American Concrete Pipe Association, worked with a company called uh, Ericsson Technologies, and they have these features in ET Culvert where um, this is a, a software that we've used, that some of our manufacturers use, but what's great about it is it allows you to check, and it supports all these different uh, specifications, including Ashto and ASTM. Uh, it, it uses ARIMA. You can choose between LRFD, ARIMA loading. Um, it has fully parametric design and checks multiple trucks automatically. You can actually decide whether you want to do rebar or mesh reinforcement. So it gives you that option and it will generate a bar and wire table for a, or a mesh sheet inventory for you to design. So this is a, a really cool, cool software that, that we've, that the American Concrete Pipe Association has been working with with Ericsson to de to develop and design, it's been really uh, really good, and, and we've we've been uh, we've been able to use it. There's other other uh, you know software that you can use to analyze these things, but but ET Culvert's been been really good. So I'll jump into uh, hydraulics next, and then we'll be handing back to Randy in just a moment. But when we look at hydraulics, right, when we're dealing with the Manning's roughness coefficient, when we're checking precast structures, whether that's box culvert or pipe, when we're in the laboratory, we're getting a Manning's end value of 0 0.01, all right? Now, 
that's really low and that's in laboratory conditions where everything's perfect you know and we're using clean water and we don't have any debris and no silt or anything in there so what we recommend is that when you're doing a precast structure whether it's a, a box culvert or a or a, a a pipe we're recommending that you use a manning's end of 0 0.012 now i should point out that if you were to go to a table and you were to look at, at, at like a box culvert or concrete in a table, they may, sometimes you see a Manning's end recommendation of 0 0.015. Keep in mind that that is typical for cast in place because when you're doing cast in place, uh, you usually have these rough form marks. Um, you've got some other discrepancies and some inconsistencies when, when you're, that you would encounter out in the field. And so engineers will often read this chart and say, oh, we're gonna use a 0 0.015 for this yet, where we're manufacturing these boxes in very qual you know tight quality controlled situations there uh we're we're making sure that that we're meeting all of these minimum tolerances a little bit easier and better than we can out in the field and so so a 0 0.012 the difference between 0 0.012 and 0 0.015 might be uh you know a, a whole jump in size in box culvert of a, a couple more feet which can can increase your cost quite a bit so keep that in mind that that with cast in place, you're able to use a 0 0.012. Uh, when we look at skew, okay, this is something that, that C1577 talks about as well. When you look at the skew angles, C1577 allows you to go up to a 30% skew angle, right? So on the left-hand side, that's not skewed, it's straight. And on the right-hand side there, you can see that there's a skew angle. If you go to the next slide there, this is a, a, a set of plans where you can see the box culvert goes from left to right okay and then you've got your northbound and southbound lanes running that traffic running down and if, if randy if you'll highlight that skew angle there if you notice it says 27 degrees so you're going to look at that and go oh 27 c 1577 is under 30 uh we can use that well this actually is pulling 27 percent from the from the horizon there we actually need to go 20, so we need to look at what the skew angle is in relation to the flow of traffic, okay? Not, not straight across on the horizon. So technically, your skew angle is actually 63 degrees, right? So you're not able to use 1577. This would be a situation where you need to do a special design and look into load rating. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Randy where he could talk a little bit about load rating. Thanks, Jason. Um, Sorry, sometimes I felt like the junior companion that fell asleep. <laughs> uh, not, not that you were boring, but um, usually I was able to catch up on the film strips if that doesn't date me. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, Jason mentioned, so typically what's happening is we've got circumferential still going around the box and then we've got longitudinal still. And when that skew angle gets really large, over 30 degrees, we may have to design to add more longitudinal steel. And that's what's called out in ASTM C1577. So that's part of what he talked about. Now, load rating is a whole other thing. Now for FHWA projects and other different bridge projects, 20 foot is typically in Utah considered a bridge, the 20 foot span but it's how that span is measured that you need to look at. So this is out of FHWA and you take and you look at the actual distance, this B distance through the cross section of how it's crossing the road and that's where it needs to be 20 feet. So you could have three culverts at a skew like this that turn into a structure technically and should be load rated. Um, this was the example in that plan we showed you before. There was actually a 63 degrees skew in that roadway so the box culvert was running almost parallel to the road as it cut under so the the way the traffic impacts it's going to be different so this 10 foot span then actually has i think a 22 foot span across the road based on that 63 degree cosine and then it needs to be load rated so this structure had to be load rated even though it's only a 10 foot wide structure um, and you can see that again, how that worked out. Let's talk a little bit about how these are constructed. Um, we typically want to make sure that we have a really good foundation. That's the main thing. If, if it's sinking in underneath this, you're going to have to over excavate and bring in a better foundation. Now, according to the geotechnical report, 
it is going to tell you what that is and what your bedding is, but we want at least six inches bedding. And we're calling out a three quarter inch max bedding typically. And that's in both uh, APWA and UDOT specs that you'll see something of that kind of gradation. Um, the thing that we really like to do, we're going to talk to UDOT some more about, um, we really feel like when we do a leveling course with like, and we hate pea gravel as far as um, structure goes, but as far as just creating a leveling course that can be raked really flat, that's forgiving when there's some mud on the box or something else, this pea gravel helps these to be more constructible. So we usually call out a two inch leveling course. Um, you can see this one up here up in Logan. This is the opposite side of the box. So this hasn't been raked, but you can see how fine that is. Um, now, when we take these boxes, we're going to pull them together. The box on the left is going to be stationary and we're going to move the box on the right in place. Uh, we don't want to drag it along that gravel. We want to bring it in a little bit higher and with the weight still on the crane. And we're going to then pull this tongue or or spigot end, depending on how you call it, into the groove or bell end. And so you can see this is up there. You can see this is raked pretty fine there. And you can see that they're keeping this two or three inches off the top of the ground. And they're going to pull the spigot into the bell. And then as they get close, they're going to lower that down. And you can see where they've dug a small shovel trench there so if they drag any material it doesn't drag into the joint. You can see them landscape breaking this pea gravel. Um, they're keeping the weight on the crane and you can see them getting that all ready. Um, one of the things is this is a mastic joint. Now mastic is not meant to be a watertight joint. Uh, we can get a little bit of water tightness. It'll seal up pretty good but it's probably two PSI or something like that. If you need to do more up in Logan Canyon up here, they seek a flex the inside of these joints and made it watertight. Um, and there's some other options out there if, if you have the need for a watertight joint. Most times if it's a canal, you don't really, you have so much water savings over what it was that you don't really worry about it. Um, you can see that that mastic has a certain cross-sectional area, usually about a half, one and a half square inches. You can see that we're putting on it on the leading edge of the tongue and on the receiving end, we're putting it down on the bottom and it doesn't go around the bottom of this other end because it would just fall off. So it's um, probably three quarters of it is on the one piece and then just the bottom um, quarter or less than that, it's on the other piece and they just barely overlap. Uh, you don't need to do a mortar grout. Always, sometimes if it's like a pedestrian tunnel, you may want to do it for aesthetics or, or so people can go through it on their roller blades. Um, and then um, you just want to remember that you need to do something else if you need water tightness. Um, you can see how that mastic fits in that joint. You want it to sit here and you want it to roll back in this annular space. You can see where we typically call out a half inch gap. So that's left over and you don't wanna see mastic squeezing out here or up here. Um, you can see how we place that again and we do have a winter grade mastic that's available. So um, I'm gonna keep going here for time. Uh, this will just give you an idea on a project. We actually had different cover depths over the top of this box. So when we laid it out, all the part A boxes were shallower cover and the part B boxes were deeper cover and that would be painted on the box. So you need to make sure that the right section of box goes in the right location. Um, and that's common to do that and to need to be checked and coordinated in the field. Uh, you can see that when we wanna look for a half inch gap, contractors get creative and they use like plywood shims to pull that together. Uh, we put the date, the loading, the size, and the section on each one. We stencil those in. You can see where we can build elbows in there, where that's been cut when it was green and then grouted back together. Um, it used to be that they used to put a pipe puller in the pipe, and then they would put I-beams in the end, and they would pull this together. 
And it was kind of dangerous and it didn't always work out and it didn't always happen. So what we have done is we put pulling inserts in every box and then use come alongs and chains to pull these boxes together. And you want to have two or three boxes tied together so you have some weight to pull against and you can see them pulling that together. As far as scheduling goes, you want to know the contractor just needs to know the weight of each section. Now this is a big issue. Contractors will get the lightest crane they think they can get away with. And so we're always reminding them that it's not just a stationary loading. Sometimes it's getting it off the trucks that's their worst pick. So we need to remind them they need to not skimp on the crane. Um, there's times when we can ship more than one box on a truck, depending on its size. So we need to think of how many are gonna come at a time. We need to make sure the joint sealant's there and that's how you put together a delivery schedule. Now we're seeing these go in, oh, they'll, they can go in as quick as every half hour uh, or even faster. So we try and coordinate who the contractor is and how far away it is and what we can get there. Uh, on this job, these were huge, um, almost 80,000 pound boxes. So they thought they'd do six a day. They ended up doing 13 and coordinating delivery and getting them staged on site and everything else is quite a logistical issue. But if, if we have pre-cons and do the right thing, we, it really works out well. Um, just to keep in mind that we can do precast wing walls um, and end sections. And depending on how this are, this one, this ends or wing walls to the side, they were freestanding with footings. And we, they had to arrive in three pieces that are weld plated together and all tied together before we uh, before we backfill. Um, this was up in Logan Canyon and we were just backfilling it after the fact. All, the whole thing was functional and running before they went back and built a trail over it. Uh, this was our structural engineer that likes to, thinks he's a male model, but um, he, he was showing off some of these wing walls that we've sent out and you can see how they're freestanding. Uh, just to give you an idea on a special project, this was up Logan Canyon and we beveled these boxes so they would fit the curve of the canyon. And this one, I think this one example shows that bevel. It's typically what we don't want to do, but we had 64 combinations of bevels up there. You can see this is like a five inch bevel in our plant. And you can see how we had to ship these out in order and they had to go together so that that curve would be created. And you can see what that looked like up there. Um, so the takeaways from today, and then we can, we're, I think we're out of time. So takeaways, you ought to work with us on these. Uh, we have registered engineers stamping these, submitting these. If you know it's gonna be precast, I wouldn't even do the structural design for a cast in place one, because our design is gonna be different. Um, and a lot of the time now, because of, timing and everything else more and more of these are going to precast one of the things i wanted to point out about cast in place we've had some cast in place projects that came in quite a bit cheaper and the engineer said they're so much cheaper but we went back and checked them one that we checked um they actually weren't putting in the same steel so where we would have had number fives on 12 they were putting in number fours on 12 and the contractor was bringing in the design and we felt like this design wasn't meeting all the standards that we thought it should meet. So uh, keep in mind that we ought to be comparing these apples for apples and they ought to all be very rigorous design and, and structure. Um, as far as you can just specify these and have precast on there and the manufacturer can do all the submittal on them as long as you give some very basic layout and everything, you learned that today. And then Contractor installation, we talked about that. That's one of the critical processes, but since we've updated specifications and had our own recommendations, these have gone together very well and very tight. And we find that every time we go out and work on a project, usually we're getting two or three more back from designers because they loved it and the contractor loved it. So that's what I've got for today. Jason, I guess we could open it up to- yeah. uh,
I've got question. I've got one more poll question based on what you just talked about with having um you know some manufacturers that were doing you know different designs of things. I just I'm gonna add, I'm gonna launch this poll question now for those of you that have had trouble voting. I'm told that if you minimize the if you're doing the full screen on this, if you minimize it, then you'll have access to be able to touch the buttons, and so you'll be able to you'll be able to vote. But this is the question: Do you require that a precast box culvert manufacturer meet a QAQC program in your specifications? Uh, so, for instance, ACPA QCAST or NPCA certified, PCI certified. There's different certifications. Uh, go ahead and vote. Do you does your specification require a QAQC program? I'm hoping by minimizing the page, maybe that'll help more of you vote this time. Okay. We're already up above the percentage that voted last time, so I wonder if that's if that works better. So thank you for the uh, for the comment on how to get these vote these votes in here, and then after this we will uh, we'll answer some questions. Uh, Randy, you had a video. Do you want to do you want to show the video of them installing a box culvert this week that we got? Uh, yeah. Let me. We let got me some time. Let me. I'm gonna close this out here. It looks like about 80% have voted here. So I'm gonna share this. It looks like about 50%, 49 of you said yes. If you are using APWA specs, that is correct. The the you would have to uh, meet the NPCA or ACPA certification for box culverts. Um, UDOT has the similar similar specs, so for those that are not sure if you're using either of those specs, uh, those ones would require a certification. Um, for those of you that are no, maybe consider looking at some of those either ACPA, NPCA, or PCI certifications. Um, I would say one of the three. As long as someone's doing some level of quality control, you would be in, in good hands there. So um, thank you for that. Randy, we'll let you go ahead and hit play at the bottom corner there, and we'll we'll watch this as a video. Go ahead and tell them about it. So Jason helped out in Tooele County. You can see Stansbury out in the background and you'll probably see um, the point of the mountain, the lake as we go. But they, what you can see there is they were maintaining one lane of traffic on the road to Grantsville. They have a signal controlling that, why they put in the box culvert. They've already put in half of it. You can see that's patched there. And they're building the other half. It took a day to put in half the box culvert took another day to put in the other half. Uh, takes more time to do the excavation and the uh, traffic control and all those things. But you can see this going in. This was a 12 by 12. Um, just to give an idea, uh, Mike could probably help us with this too. I know it's one of the questions. We can go up to about 30 foot of combined rise and span in a four-sided box culvert. So that's about the range. Each manufacturer is probably slightly different, but, and then we have to look at the weights that we can ship and how we can get it there, so. I think, Randy, I would agree with that. That's pretty, that's a pretty good just rule of thumb to use. Okay, so yeah, this is, this was a box cover that actually we were looking at different options. We were looking at, um, you know, just like a, a corrugated metal structure. Um, it's a pedestrian walkway uh, connecting a park to a development over there in the Stansbury area. and. Um, they were looking at cast in place, and I recommended that for the for the speed and the, the number of the 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 heavy traffic. This is the, basically the one way in and out of Grantsville there, um, from connecting Stansbury and uh, to Grantsville. So uh, instead of going all the way down to Tooele and out on the freeway and then back to Grantsville, so I, I suggested that we look at that precast as a, as a more viable option because it's so much faster. We don't have to worry about the curing times out there, and so. Uh, that's what the design engineer ended up doing. So this was a good good project. Hey, to answer some of the questions, we've still got a, quite a few of you on the line here. So I'm going to answer these questions here. Great questions today. I want to thank you uh, for submitting those. Feel free to continue to submit them if you want. Um, it looks like we've, we've solved the problem of why the poll question wasn't working for some people. Uh, but we had some question about the AS5 steel areas. Now, uh, Christine Isom asked these questions about AS5. Now, if you remember back to that drawing, uh, her question was, is AS5 always in the top and bottom mat? The drawing only circled the bottom mat. Now, the AS5 steel was, if you remember, that's that that uh, perpendicular steel to the hoop steel or the distribution steel. And yes, she's absolutely right. It's actually only in the the bottom mat on the top, so the inside mat of that of that top slab. And the reason is, is because that's where when we've got, and remember, it's only in the zero to two. 
uh, feet, right? So when we're when we're looking at this, it's only in that zero to two feet section because it's so we've got so much heavier live loads there that you need to have that distribution steel to to absorb some of that as well. So that's actually only in the 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 inside cage on the top slab. It's not on the inside cage of the bottom slab. It's not. Um, the AS7 is the different steel that's in the top cage or the outside cage of the top slab, and the AS8 is your is your outside cage on the bottom slab. But yes, AS5, uh, you're right, Christine. It's only in that inner cage on the top slab. That's the only only place that we need to add that distribution steel. Thank you for for asking that. That's a great chance for us to clarify that. Uh, Christine also had a question: Can welded wire be provided in coated? Per uh, U dot section zero three two one one, Mike and Randy, I'll let you guys address that. So, so in the coating of that, we do galvanized welded wire when we do meet the coating specification. It doesn't really work well to do epoxy coated, but galvanized meets that specification. Um, the next question is: uh, Do you ever make box culvert with no haunches? Um, so if you'd noticed in the in the drawing that Randy was showing that was bid out as precast as an as an alternate, this the detail on that showed no haunches. And if you ever see a, a drawing with no haunches, that's going to be um, be a, a cast in place. Cast in place typically doesn't have haunches. Precast will always have haunches. Randy, why is that? Why do we always put haunches in our precast boxes? Well, one, it's part of the stripping process. It's it's tougher for us to strip the form off of a, a hard corner, mm -hmm. but it's also helps us with that span. It changes the effective span you've got, and those haunches help reinforce that. So when I see a cast in place box that has a lot less steel and it doesn't have haunches, um, makes me wonder what they did in their design. Great, good, good point there. So there's Jason. There's Hey Jason, I will add to that though, just as a side comment, it can be done if, if, if there's an absolute reason for it. Um, both companies, I'm sure, would, would find a way to design it and, and do it if it had to be done. Okay. But, but there are benefits, like Randy said, of having them there. That's good to and know. So, so Nathan asked that it's question. It's not an easy process. Yeah, it's right. To get it's not on. Process, but if necessary, it can be done. Okay. Okay. Um, all righty, let's see here. Uh, want to thank Adam Wright for figuring out to change it to window mode and not full screen mode so that you can answer those questions. Thanks, Adam. Um, Christine asks also, uh, what precast sizes are are available? What What's our, um, maybe we'll have both of you, Old Castle and Geneva, answer this. What are your What are your limits um, on how big you can go on, on precast? And that was the 30 foot that we talked about. Yeah, 30 yeah, foot of combined resin yeah. span. Excellent. So 30 we can go is the highest we can go on precast. All right. And then um, how do you ensure box culverts and transition structures match up well? Rick, great question. Is there a recommendation on how to mesh things and not need a special cast in place collar? Great question, Rick. Thank you. Randy, uh, what, are you, what have you seen in the past? Maybe Mike, you can jump in as well if you have any suggestions uh, on, on closure. Is there another option other than just a closure pour or what are you guys seeing? I like to recommend that they are uh, match cast in the in the plant so that we take like a wing wall and we have it cast into the actual box or next to the actual box culvert that it's going to be up against so that that box culvert is the form and it, it is lined up perfectly and making sure that these are dry fit also so that before it goes out of the plant that the the plant's checking it, make sure it fits together well, and then the contractor knows what he's getting is going to fit. Okay. Okay, perfect. Um, same. So, so is that so is that kind of the case as well, Randy? If you've got a, a situation where you have an existing, say, say an existing cast in place box that you need to now extend, maybe you're widening the road, you need to put in two or three more more uh, box sections on the side what's a what's a good option to tie into an existing say cast in place or even an existing uh precast box you you might have to do a collar or a um or a 
what a cold a pour in there okay. um, to connect those. It really depends on what you've got. There are times when you can tie them together really easily, mm -hmm. and there are times when they just don't fit very well, and you got to do a closure pour. Excellent. Randy mentioned uh, dry fitting. We've seen issues where um, you know we get a box covered out to this out out uh, to the job, and they're not fitting well together. And people say, well. You know your tolerances are off. You you manufacture these incorrectly, and by dry fitting them in the plant, we can ensure that they do meet. And then we still get them out to the to the yard and or out to the job site, and they're not they're still not fitting together well. And they're what the problem is is a lot of times that leveling course that Randy talked about hasn't been smoothed out enough, and so they're they're a little off. If you're using big aggregates and things, it's almost like a a, a table with three three legs. You know, it, it's just it balances on those. On those bigger materials and so it's really important that we get these things leveled out and and i, I just thought that was interesting when randy brought up dry fitting it just made me think about some issues we've had in the past so okay um last question here that i have is uh how do you tie together transversely a two cell box or a three cell box um Maybe help me understand here, Christine, what you're talking about tying together transversely. I, I'm guessing just how do they how do they connect to one another? Is that Randy? Do you do you understand what we're trying to ask here? So, so if it's like parallel boxes coming out and going into like the wing walls and different mm -hmm. things, some of those are more cast in place. It depends on the size. I think we built structures that are big enough to take two small boxes to come in them. And transition into a different pipe or structure, but sometimes the size doesn't work out, and you have to cast in place some of those transitions. And in like underground detention, it may just be that you need a pipe to equalize the flow, not mm -hmm. not like a head wall in it. So it depends on what it is. So can you build, and, let's say, multiple cell boxes? Let's say it's a it's a, a you need instead of two ten by ten boxes, can you do it. A, a 20 by 10 and just have a have a, a wall in the middle of it i think that's what you're asking here christine is multiple boxes uh, multiple they, cell boxes they do that back in the midwest okay but here most of the canal companies do not want a center wall and most of these have gone in canals historically so they don't want a debris catcher or a maintenance issue so they've asked for full open open flow in those and no no column in the center no wall in the center so that's mm -hmm. typically why we've done them that way and we don't really have the form set up to build them they'd have to be precise formed or custom formed to do that it can be done but typically hey, hey. If we're doing multiple boxes we're going to build them separate and then set them next to each other and and uh I i'm guessing the weight of the boxes is enough to hold them in together or do we have to bind them together in any way no, Jason, I'll jump in on that one. I think my guess, maybe some of what she's asking is, yeah, what do you do from run to run of culvert? You are going to have a double or double barrel. And a lot of time, what I've seen that works real well is you separate them by three to four and and just put a, a simple, simple tight material in between the different runs. That's, that's what I've seen most of the time. But no, they don't need to be mechanically attached from bay to bay okay um sounds good one one last question here uh can we discuss old castle and geneva's capabilities with respect to clamshell precast structures like what are your maximum sizes of if you're going to do like a a clamshell so what what michael's asking there as far as clamshell is if you if you have a really large structure instead of instead of building it all four-sided you take two three-sided structures and stack them on top of each other randy what's What's Old Castle? Uh, what's your your maximum there? Um, we show it combined. You know, this would be two pieces. Would be a combined opening of thirty foot span by twenty foot high, okay. um, which is pretty close to our max. Okay, I'm assuming Geneva's is probably pretty similar there. Yep, I would completely agree with that. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions and. Uh, it, I, I did get some feedback that we answered all of the questions uh, that that uh, that some of these people had, and so thank you all for for joining us again. If you need additional references, please reach out to myself 
um, or Randy or, or Mike or Heather at Geneva. We've got some great resources here locally in our, in our market here that we can help you guys out with. Um, mountainstates.concretepipe.org is a great resource if you want to want to go and download that that uh, box culvert spec that I was telling you about. If anybody wants to use elements of that, I've got it in PDF and Word format. Feel free to utilize that on projects. That was the spec that was used on that uh, Tooele project out there in Stansbury, and it, it worked out really well for us. So feel free to go there. That's got all of our contact information on it as well. Uh, I will be posting this to YouTube either tonight or tomorrow. So if you want to go back and rewatch it, um, uh, you know, I, I recommend that you watch it with with that special someone in your life as a date night tonight. That would be really nice for you. I, I think they'd give you brownie points for being thoughtful about that. Uh, Randy, Mike, anything you want to close with before we go? Just thanks for joining us and everyone hang in there. Um, we're we're in May now, so yeah. which I read this morning is now the fifth level of Jumanji. We uh, we made it through the fourth level. We're now <laughs> in the fifth, so. all right. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Mike, anything before we go? Uh, no, I'd say stay safe and uh, reiterate, I think, what Randy and Jason have said. When all else is well, just reach out and ask questions, and we will do everything we can to help. Awesome. Okay, thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Uh, we'll Hopefully, we catch you next week. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye-bye.